He is a young journalist, but a veteran as well from the Daily Times and DelmarvaNow.com, Ricky Pollitt. How are you today, Ricky? I'm doing great, Earl. Thanks for having me on. I am glad to have you in, and I wanted to talk to you, especially you being a sports journalist, working in a newsroom now, seeing what that environment is like, and it seems like it's such a drastic change from even when I was there just barely 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I came into the newsroom in March 2017, so we're coming up on two years, and even from that moment... I mean, it's changed a lot. You know, literally, it has because we moved buildings, I guess, about uh, a little over a year ago. Um, but when I came in here, you know, we had a number of veteran reporters, so many resources, which I guess even looking further back were less resources than maybe guys like you and, you know, others who have worked here before. It was less than you guys had. But, you know, coming in as a kid right out of college, uh, it was like a kid in a candy shop. But now there are definitely a lot more open seats. But I think the quality is still there. You know, we still have a lot of really talented journalists covering Delmarva and um, getting out the truth and the facts. And especially nowadays where there's so much scrutiny of journalists, the fake news era, if you will. It's so important, starting at the local level, to have news you can turn to, accurate reporting and reporters who are passionate about what they're doing. Yeah, and my experience prior to changing, I guess, careers, I think the biggest thing you can say, there's nothing mm. sadder than looking how a newspaper industry has changed by looking around a newsroom. It looks like mm -hmm. a graveyard sometimes. Even in my last newspaper job, it was a graveyard. It was the saddest thing seeing people get let go and seeing a lot of things slip through the cracks news-wise and it being out of the hands of the people who lead the newsrooms. We were talking about it a little before we came on, but again, I, I've been here for two years now, and um, other than one reporter we have down in Virginia, I'm the senior reporter, and it's unbelievable sometimes. Uh, we recently lost um, two veteran reporters in Susan Parker and Liz Holland, who were well-known around the community, great journalists. They did early retirement, but still, those were two who I know when I first came in, I thought... Well, you know, I'll never come to work one day and Susan and Liz aren't here. So just that alone has been uh, kind of weird to adjust to. Yeah, Liz was working at the Somerset Herald when I was a reporter. And Susan, I remember, was work working in editorial and opinions. And I just saw that was a stark change, too. It just I don't know if it was just a downsizing that occurred. I just don't understand just how roles have changed so quickly. But I, I look back just like four years ago they had this whole newsroom of the future plan that went through and it was one of those ideas that didn't seem like it stick that long because as soon as that happened things changed again in the corporate mm -hmm. structure and yeah it doesn't make any sense when you have limited people covering things and limited resources as it is with the constant cutting of budgets and things like that there's no mm -hmm. way that local news can be covered at all yeah, I mean, speaking from a sports reporter perspective, my job, technically, I'm supposed to be covering Lower Delaware, uh, the three lower counties in Maryland, as well as the Eastern Shore of Virginia. I'm one guy, so to do all of that is just short of impossible. I certainly do my best, but I think my editors and you know my colleagues, and I, I think at this point, the general public realizes, look, you know, he can't get to every school, he can't get to every game. But I think pretty early on when I got here, I chose quality over quantity. You know, it's not necessarily about getting as many stories out in a day as you can. It's about, you know, putting the time and effort into these really solid stories that people want to read. Yeah, and I remember that's about probably somewhere near 16, 17, 18 schools, especially if you add in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And at one point we had three people full-time in the Salisbury office and then maybe a couple people at the weeklies and even then it was still tough to cover everything yeah just last week um a longtime reporter and strategist here ryan marshall left the daily times he had been here for six years and uh with his last day uh, my editor ben Pinserga was pulling up uh, an old newspaper clipping from i guess when he was first here which was 2013 and it was just amazing to see a sports page and see multiple bylines from Daily Times sports reporters. And I jokingly said, oh, you're, you're looking at the glory days because I would love just one sports reporter to help me out. I couldn't imagine having another three or four.
Yeah, it's a frustrating thing to see that you're going to get complaints from people in the community saying, why can't you cover us enough? And it's mm-hmm. bad enough when you feel like you're covering a team. It felt like sometimes when I was there that we were embedded with some of these teams and beats. I remember a season basically going around covering the Bennett baseball team. I know Ryan was covering mm-hmm. Parkside football. Sean would cover yeah. UMES and SU basketball. And mm-hmm. yeah, and even then, you still try to manage to get stories out in addition to doing all that other stuff. And there were still people complaining. And, and I know you can't satisfy everybody. You're not going to make everybody happy all the time. But just to see that now, how it's dwindled down to the point where it feels like a small town newspaper when it shouldn't be, it's remarkable. Yeah, I, I grew up around here and I remember the Daily Times was always, you know, the place to be when it came to news. I, I remember every morning before going to school, uh, this is when I was in middle school and high school, I'd ask my dad to see the sports page. And, you know, I could always rely on you know, local content in there from you know, some of the best reporters around. But to, to get back to something earlier you were saying, I think it was maybe my third or fourth day here. And I was coming back from Worcester Prep after covering kind of a guest speaker who was there talking to the lacrosse team. And I I remember I was 15 minutes late or past deadline. My photos weren't uploading. My internet was horrible. And I was saying to myself, did I make the right decision? Is this a good move for me? For that brief second, I questioned, you know, whether I should have taken this job. But the next day, you know, I woke up. I had a much better attitude and I just went forward saying, look, kind of like you said, there's no way I'm going to please everyone. Just last week, I got an email from a guy saying, why aren't you covering my son? But I think it's all about the mindset. Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of times I'm frustrated with this job and with the lack of resources I have. But at the end of the day, they're paying me to write about sports. So, I mean, in my opinion, I have the best job in the world. So I'm going to go out there with a positive mindset. I've always said, you know, I'm not even doing any work. I'm writing down what these athletes are doing. They're the ones going out and doing all the work. I just write it down. So I do my best not to complain. It is hard, but it really is a fulfilling career at the end of the day. Oh, yeah. And I loved being out there covering. You sometimes find the best stories when you're able to have a little more time and more resources digging into things. Hey, you may hear some scuttlebutt. And then... You may pursue it to find out maybe it leads somewhere, maybe it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But I just go back to when I got the news, when they were doing this whole reorganization, I got saddled with a desk job. I tried to put up a brave front and, oh yeah, I wasn't happy at all. I was honestly thinking I'd just quit and leave them in the lurch because at this point, honestly, I felt my use and my career had just been sort of severed. Because mm-hmm. there's talk about building brands and things like this, establishing a community. What well, am I now sitting at a desk? I, I always tell people this, and I was telling a coworker this before. It's like, imagine being a cop and being out on the beat every day in your life and then getting moved to a desk job. You're not going to be happy. You may pursue some other line of the work. If there was a change in pay going upwards to sort of calm those ills maybe that'll work i always see it like this sad thing it goes like to pro sports the best way to calm people who are unhappy unless they're eternally unhappy and nothing will ever satisfy them more responsibility more limelight more money those are the three things that'll make anybody a little more grateful and and at least bearable but when none of that happened you're just sitting there drifting i don't really want to be here I'm stuck at a permanent time that I can't get out early. I can't interact with people. I can't do anything. What's the point? And I don't want to sound like I'm jaded either because as easy as it is to be jaded and bitter, I don't admit I'd be lying to myself and I'd be lying to everybody else saying I still don't get angry about it. But that's life. And I felt like now I've had a bit of a change. I'm working a new job where... I'm still interacting with people. I'm actually being creative, doing stuff like that. And first time I'm traveling for a job. Wouldn't have ever been able to have that opportunity at my previous stop after the mm. times. Yeah. There's never, I think, anything wrong with doing a, a change of scenery. You know, I, 
I technically fall into the uh, the millennial class. I, I don't often identify myself as a millennial, but I think, you know, I do have that mindset where, you know, no matter how bad things get, you know, I, I guess not to sound cliche, but I control my own destiny. You know, I can go do something else if I put my mind to it, if I work hard. Um, I'm never one to toot my own horn, but you know, I, I know I'm talented. I, I know I can write. So should it ever come, I think I can, you know, make the switch, but, uh, I don't know. It, that hasn't happened yet. And I hope it doesn't. Yeah. I always call it a Bowser moment. It's like in super Mario brothers, you think you go to the <laughs> castle and you have Bowser shooting the fire and then some levels throwing the hammers and you're trying to get over or under him to pull that ax. And as soon as you pull the ax, you know, Bowser's standing there knowing that he's going to fall. That's the Bowser mm -hmm. moment where you're falling <laughs> to your certain doom. <laughs> I like that. The biggest thing um, I wanted to discuss to you is about your interest in becoming a journalist in general, as well as becoming a sports journalist. What led to getting into journalism? Well, it, it's kind of a long story. Um, a little funny as well. But, um, you know, I, I grew up like almost at any other kid. I, I was playing sports. I played almost every sport imaginable, come to think of it, as I was growing up. And uh, once I got to high school, I found out I wasn't very good. So, you know, any dreams of playing professional or even playing in college at that point kind of went out the door. I remember I, I went out for the school's basketball team and a day in, I broke my wrist as a freshman. So that basically, it didn't technically, you know, end my athletic career. But after that, I decided to pursue other interests and kind of just uh, hang up my cleats, if you will. So um, I always watched uh, the NFL, the MLB, NBA. Um, and was really big into sports and even through high school i told people i want to work for espn one day you know i want to do something whether i'm a commentator or a reporter or a writer just you know i want to say that every day i get to wake up and go cover sports so um after high school uh, i really hadn't done anything in high school in terms of you know advancing my career i didn't write for my school paper I, I didn't even reach out to the Daily Times for an internship because, you know, I, I was a high schooler. I was a teenager. I wasn't really thinking about it at that point. So I got to college. I went to Salisbury University right down the street. And my freshman year, I kind of took things easy, you know, got acclimated to the college scene. And then my sophomore year, before the school year started, I received an email from Tim Brennan, who I believe is also a former colleague of yours and the, uh, the current sports information director at Salisbury saying, we're looking for play-by-play -play broadcasters for the student sports network. And as I was growing up, <laughs> mainly because I didn't want to listen to Chris Collinsworth and John Madden while playing uh, video games, I would turn down the commentary and do my own commentary of the game. So this was the perfect opportunity for me. I thought, well, this is great. I'll get to go watch football games, call them, you know, the famous SU lacrosse team. So I, I joined and, um, you know, was able to get the job there and did that for three years, worked my way up to the lead play-by-play -play guy, called, you know, Salisbury University's championship lacrosse team a few times, covered almost every sport there. And it was great. I had developed this mindset that after college, I was going to go on and be a broadcaster and work my way up to CBS, you know, one day call a Super Bowl in my young, naive mind. So I guess my junior year came along and I said, it's so competitive out there. I can't just be a broadcaster. I need to have something else that makes me stand out. So I decided to start writing and I declared a, a degree in uh, journalism and PR. And I started writing for The Flyer, which is uh, Salisbury University student newspaper. And after a year there, I was made the sports editor and about one semester after becoming the sports editor, I started freelancing for the Daily Times. And, you know, while I loved broadcasting, I think I loved writing even more because in broadcasting, you're calling a game and there's these little windows where you can talk about, you know, maybe some deep background, a player's profile, if you will. But with the pen in hand, I mean, you can just dive into everything. Every little detail can be written. The quotes, you can set the scene. And it just amazed me at what I could do with my writing. So I really fell in love with that. Once college got over with, I took a broadcasting job calling the UMES volleyball team. Really enjoyed that. But as you can imagine, the money wasn't there. And as a guy getting out of college, the student loans start to kick in very fast. So I knew I needed something that could really pay the bills, essentially. And I got pretty lucky. After, um, after volleyball season, I called a little women's basketball for UMES. And then the job here at the Daily Times opened up, and I've been here ever since. 
and I can definitely hear the radio voice that you have. <laughs> so I still think one thing you should always do, go out and do demos. You never know. Yeah, yeah. You never know what you can do until you do a demo. I know some people hate hearing the sound of their voice. And, and that's a common thing that I've learned, especially in radio class when I was at uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. And that's the biggest thing. And what makes it tough, I feel like, with this job as a reporter, that you don't have enough time or the hours that allow you to do maybe a side hustle. So it makes it a lot yeah. tougher to do those things. But sometimes you have to integrate them as best you can. And I feel like, especially with all the assets and things that you have around you, that's something that's very beneficial. And I think that being a reporter, especially sports reporter, and I like looking at that. I was mentioning before in a previous podcast episode, the cool thing about it, it's along the lines of being a crime reporter and maybe going to court. Because what you see is the unfettered truth, and it's all out in the open. And the biggest thing is you have to best use your words to put out what you saw for everybody else to understand and read. Yeah, I guess I didn't notice it as much as I was growing up. And in fairness, I don't think there was as much of it growing up. But um, when I took this job, I just noticed the huge amount of talent that's here when it comes to whether it's high school athletics college athletics i mean we're seeing kids constantly sign division one scholarships and go on and play at the highest level and for me i mean my favorite days of the job are always when i get to cover uh college signings because you know seeing the look on these athletes face you know seeing all the hard work pay off that's really what does it for me in a way you know I, sports reporting for me has really become a responsibility we don't do recaps that much anymore i guess it was after my first three months here when they kind of revitalized the entire sports strategy, they cut all recaps and really just focused on enterprise and feature stories. Now, I had my thoughts about that, but it's been a year and a half. So, you know, I, I've gotten used to it. And um, the way I really look at it is, you know, it's, it's my job to tell these kids stories. I mean, uh, with all due respect to the TV stations around here, they can only get about, you know, a 90 second soundbite at that. And it's highlights for the most part. Whenever I would look at an athlete, I can look at a box score and see what he or she did. But by talking to him or her and finding out what drives them, you know, what are you playing for? That's the story I'm interested in, kind of what happens on the sidelines, what happens in the locker room, et cetera. And as you mentioned, the talented players that are on the Eastern Shore, especially the Lower Eastern Shore, sometimes they don't get the opportunities that maybe their counterparts, maybe a little further up north or maybe in Delaware would get. And I feel like I don't know if it's just a lack of exposure or maybe there's some type of mentality that maybe hounds them. I, I don't know. I feel like there are a lot of talented kids here. Maybe it's just genetic. Sometimes they're not big enough. If they were in Baltimore, maybe they'd get that exposure, regardless of height. I did a story on three of the guys who played high school basketball around here and who are currently playing in college, um, that being Corey Holden, Jordan Duffy, and Kavea Luma. And I was talking to Corey. He told me that the biggest regret he had was not going over the bridge to play AAU or play in some of the summer leagues because he didn't get the exposure. And, um, you know, even back then when Corey was playing, I think there were more sports reporters. Corey was the talk of the town. So around here, he was definitely getting the exposure. So I think in the past, people look at the Eastern Shore and, you know, Lower Delaware and kind of just disregard it because we don't have a great history of high school athletes. But again, just in the last few years, it seems like it's been a very, uh, it's really increased. And, you know, I, I know myself and a lot of others, we do our job to make sure these kids get recognized. Oh, yeah. And, and that's one thing. And it's funny, looking back, it feels like for every Corey, Jordan, Colin Gaynor at UMES and, and, and Dana Godwin yeah. and, at UMES as well, there's plenty of others that, man, I can just go back off the top of my head and think about 10 people I know that had talent that either squandered it or didn't have the grades. And it just yeah. sort of makes you wonder why. Cause then all you hear about what they used to do, what they used to do. I mean, I hate throwing names out, but I could name a guy like, let's be honest, a Larry Ennis who had talent, just yeah. Yeah. too many things befell him. And that's a sad thing. And then I think like a Delonte waters or a Keith Jackson, 
uh, Cody Jacoby. Mm -hmm. There's so many people. I don't like calling their names out because they're not the only ones. There's plenty of them. Deron Ames. Yeah, I guess in this case, I am calling them all out. There's too many people with too much talent. A bunch of those guys set records in their schools. Keith Jackson was probably maybe as a result of his game at the state semis. It's been so long ago. He basically was probably ended up scoring all but like five points for Snow Hill, and they lost by two. Yeah. I look at Deron Ames and Delonte Waters, 5,000 yards each. Along mm -hmm. the lines of Tavon Austin, Ben Tate, plenty of other guys. They could have easily went somewhere. And it's frustrating to see these guys. I would have killed for that talent. That's the one thing I remember why I used to do, especially for football, that you had to have a 3.0 in order to play. Not a 2-5, not a 2, a 3. So that means you have to be a good student in addition to being a good athlete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I won't drop any names just because a few of them are still playing. But, you know, I'll, I'll be at the games and, again, kind of know the athletes, see their talent, but know just what kind of student they are. And it's sad because you know right there this is their peak. Though You always hear about those guys who peaked in high school and will forever be talking about the glory days when they won a state championship or something. And it's sad because you're, you're watching it and you, you know after this, they're not going to go to college, they're not going to further their degree, and they're not going to play anymore. And, you know, this is really what they're going to have to hold on to. And, you know, Larry Ennis is a really good example. Um, but uh, it's sad. And there's only so much you can do because – you know, again, as sports reporters, you have to keep a professional relationship with these athletes, especially when they're young, you know, teenagers. They're looking at you like, you know, you're one of their friends. I'm only about six years older than a lot of these kids. And of course, you know, they want the articles, they want the features, they want the spotlight. And if you do it and you do it well, you know, they love you for it. You know, they'll, they'll say, yeah, you know, I appreciate it. Can you give me this? Can you help me do that? And it's, look, I'm doing my job. You know, I'm talking about what you're doing on the field, you know, what's driving you. But other than that, you know, we need to set very strict boundaries and, you know, re realize you are the athlete. I'm the reporter. That's how it needs to be. Oh, yeah. No, I understand that completely. And I think that's more frustrating people who have the talent and don't put the effort in as opposed to injuries. Injuries happen. And those are unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. There are plenty of people who had the shot and then just injuries befell them. And then you have to fall back on something else. And those stories are sad, but those tend to happen. Just like in the professionals. Somebody has the talent. You think of what? Javid Vest, who used to play for the Lions, had uh, mm -hmm. all the talent in the world. Neck injury. That really derailed him. Yeah. But he ended up becoming a sprinter after that. And yeah. You know, you know, as opposed to maybe like a Reuben Foster or Kareem Hunt and those guys who just continue to do questionable things, hanging around questionable people. And those are major situations. And I'm not putting the issue of domestic violence lightly, but in those situations, you can't get yourself involved or something that nowadays will be taped everywhere. You got to use better judgment. Yeah, it's funny. There's the story I did. I guess it's co I'm coming up on a year on it, but. A kid who was a lot like that, He, uh, his name was Hayden Frazier. He played for the um, the Stephen Decatur boys basketball team, but he was born over in D.C., really was just involved in gang violence, if you will, most of his young adult life, um, would skip school, go to drugs, said that he would bring weapons to school a lot, was always expecting again to a fight, and if times, you know, really have to defend himself. And um, he told me, he said, look, I didn't think I was going to live past my 20th birthday. That's how bad things were. Well, I guess he was, memory serves, 15, 16 at the time, and his brother, who had moved over to the Eastern Shore to attend UMES for his master's degree, went back home, heard about all the struggles his brother was going through, and said, no, you're not going to end your life this way. You're coming with me. Brings him back over to the Eastern Shore, gets him enrolled at Stephen Decatur. Kid graduated last year. I think he was on the honor roll. He was a huge part of that Stephen Decatur basketball team that went up to the semifinals. So I think that's the perfect example that it's possible. You can be in the deepest hole, but you can climb out of it with support from those close to you, from good friends. But, you know, you have to pick up the shovel first. Oh, yeah, that's probably the most profound statement that I can think of. And that probably translates very well into writing as well about the whole shovel analogy. And that's a sad thing where there are plenty of kids who have the ability, who have the skill. You can't let one bad decision define you, but let it be a pattern where bad stuff continually happens. You have to reevaluate. Going into some of the different people that you've covered, 
I'm assuming, especially your time as a reporter, you've covered a lot of dynamic personalities. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. You know, and before I took this job, it was in the summers in college. I worked for the Ocean City Police Department as a, um, you know, seasonal booking officer. So needless to say, I saw a lot of stuff during those summers. But that also taught me how to communicate with people and how to work with every walk of life. Because a lot of people, you know, they'd come in, they've been arrested, they're having their worst day, essentially. And we would have to question them to get their information, get facts about what just happened, and essentially interview them. So that helps, you know, going from police work into reporting. And, you know, there, there are definitely times where I talk to kids or adults, even coaches, who have had a bad day, they've had a bad game, they don't want to talk to you. But you have to know, I guess, how to maneuver around that and come away from the situation getting what you want. Look, I'm a reporter. At the end of the day, I'm sorry that you're going through something. I'm sorry you lost the game, but I'm here to do a job. I need to get something from you. I'm going to take it. And um, yeah, there, there have definitely been guys who maybe don't like a question I asked or just something about me they don't like, but we sit down, you know, we work through it and I'm able to walk away with it. But, you know, kind of going back to um, your question, there's so many great people I've interviewed and, you know, some notable ones. I think interviewing Tim Tebow will always be a highlight of my career, no matter how far I go. And when I talked to Tebow, they... It was kind of like a news conference. They had so many reporters there, but I was just asking him about his experience on the Eastern Shore and you know what he liked about the area. Had he ever visited? Where did he go to eat? You know, kind of get that human interest. Everyone knows Tim Tebow's story, but I want the stuff that I can't, you know, go to another TV station or go to ESPN NFL and um, read about. And another one who's funny, and I, I don't mean to keep throwing out these pro athletes, but they're just cool situations in my mind. Another one was Justin Tucker, the Ravens kicker. He came to Delaware to, to sing. He's an opera singer. And I was able to get him on the phone a few days earlier, kind of just highlighting the event. <laughs> so at the very end, you know, I said, thanks for taking time to talk with me. And he goes, oh, of course, my friend. And jokingly, I go, oh, we're friends now. He goes, best friends. So now I always just joke with people saying, yeah, I'm best friends with Justin Tucker. So um, I always have fun with it. Every interview is something new for me. It's a new adventure. And I think being on the Eastern Shore, being in Salisbury, especially where there is a minor league baseball team, I feel like sometimes mm -hmm. you get to have encounters with potential all-stars and potential stars. I can just yeah. go back to my time covering Manny Machado and Michael yep. Givens and not so much Jonathan Scope. I don't know I talked to him that much, but just being there for that all-star game and catching Manny, talking to Bryce Harper in the clubhouse <laughs> – as they're getting done with the game. And it's really crazy to just sort of see that and think, well, five, six, seven, eight years down the road, wow, these guys are in the majors, and now they are some of the biggest name free agents in Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't had my Manny or Bryce moment yet, but um, there's a guy who I, I've heard some people say he might play at Camden Yards this year. I don't know about that, but it's um, D.L. Hall, first round pick from a few years ago uh, by the Orioles. He played for the Shorebirds last year, and um, I was doing a story on him. I'm talking to him in the Shorebirds dugout, and uh, D.L., he's, he's from Georgia, so he's got this deep southern accent. And I go, so be honest with me. You know, Tell me what you bought with that million-dollar uh, contract that you signed. What was the first thing you bought? He goes, well, I tell you, I've always wanted a truck, and I went out and bought a big truck. And I'm like, oh, well, that's great. And you know, I'm asking him about it. He goes, well, it's out in the parking lot. You want to go see it? So we walked right out. He showed me that big truck. And <laughs> yeah, it was it was just great. So when D.L. Hall is hopefully pitching in the World Series one day, you know, I, I can turn and say, hey, that guy, we had a good moment. <laughs> Yeah, and it's crazy that as soon as you said the big country drawl and the first thing was so, I guess, stereotypical that it was going to be a truck that he was going to get. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I don't know. I didn't know what they said. I was thinking, maybe, you know, sometimes you never know because, oh, man, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of different people that I've encountered. Yeah, I mean, I remember talking to Xavier Avery, former major leaguer. One time we were talking and a bee was coming around. He was just trying to duck and dive out of the way. <laughs> and still, you got to remember that these people are still human beings. In fact, sometimes you're older than some of the people you're interviewing, especially at the professional level. I was probably, what, 28 at the time when I interviewed Xavier Avery. And yeah, you just tend to forget that these guys are still kids. Yeah, and another thing, I've only 
covered probably a handful of Orioles games, but I was down in the clubhouse for one Orioles game and Adam Jones comes and stands right next to me. And this is the team I grew up watching. You know, Adam Jones is a hero in my book, but it kind of goes back to the professionalism. You know, I'm the reporter. He's an athlete. I can't be fanboy or anything right now and just act weird, essentially. You know, I, I have to be professional. And I think early on when I was still young, it was hard at times, but especially with Tim Tebow. I'll tell you, I remember Earl. I stuck my recorder out to record him and I caught my hand shaking because I was so nervous. And, you know, it's Tim Tebow, the guy everyone knows and loves. So, you know, that can be a challenge at times. But I think over time, you know, it becomes second nature. As you mentioned, you're a millennial working at a print newspaper. What are some of the advances in technology that you're seeing that are proving to be more beneficial, especially now as a reporter? Well, I tell you, it's great because I can see what kind of stories are doing well. I can see how long someone's reading a story for. And with social media, you know, I can see... I guess, what kinds of people are reading it? Are the athletes big into this story? Are the coaches big into this story? Is it just something that fans like? And it's it's really beneficial because, not to throw any shade here, but say I read an article about why high volleyball and 200 people read it. I'm not going to go back and write about why high volleyball again. But that said, when Bennett went on this historic football run here recently, winning their first playoff game since 1990, the football that is. People read that. People were into that. And I could go back and find different angles to keep milking that story, that angle for as much as I could get. And at the end of the day, I think almost every story I covered about them was able to get really solid hits and help us out. You know, don't get me wrong. We have a loyal print readership and you always want to make print readers happy. But I can't tell if you're reading my story in print. I can go to the market or a restaurant and see you reading the Daily Times, but... I mean, I don't know if you're reading my story. I don't know what you think of my story. But with online, yeah, don't get me wrong. I think maybe the higher ups emphasize online numbers a little more than needed in certain areas. But it does give you a tool to see what's doing well and what maybe you need to cast to the side. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the best things in the world, being able to know how long someone's engaged, what they're reading and seeing where that's coming from. Because I remember a story, I'm not sure if it was Carol Vaughn or someone on the Eastern Shore of Virginia. Michael Vick was there coming home from playing with the Eagles or going back up. He stopped there. He shared the story, and there were a thousand people on the story. And even then, it seems like that was some of the earlier days of, I guess, analytics and trying to get a better idea of what people were reading. And the funny thing about that is, and I look at social media now, sometimes you never know what's going to bite. You really never know what's going to bite because you can assume you can write the best story in the world and everything. It can be an issue of timing. It can be an issue of what you wrote for a headline or a teaser. The littlest things could really derail what you think could be a very popular story. And then something really stupid could actually get huge numbers. And you just never know. Yeah, and I I think that's why it's so important to understand the importance of headlines and make sure headlines are worded well. SEOs are obviously big, and that's something I know we here at Delmarva Now have really incorporated over the last several months is making sure things are SEO friendly to get as many clicks as we can. Yeah, I mean, to kind of go to your point, I recently wrote a story here about Judy Johnson, um, a Snow Hill native who played in the Negro Leagues and was probably one of the best Negro League players that ever took a diamond. But that's story did okay but it didn't do what i was hoping at least now that said i guess it was a year ago LaShawn mccoy comes down here and stays in a hotel i write that brief that blows up and it's exactly like you like you said you never know what's gonna bite with LaShawn mccoy i had a good idea just because you know that's a it's a well-known person but it also goes to show you know with the numbers and seeing what does well if i work very hard on one story and it's not going to do well I'm not going to go back and work really hard on that same story again for a follow-up or something. So it does save time, and you're able to use your resources in other areas to cover things maybe you don't uh, normally get to. And it's funny when you say the Judy Johnson thing, had that been maybe shared in Delaware Online where the Blue Rock Mm -hmm. Stadium is named after him or there's reference to him, that probably blows up. You never know, but... Uh, That's another thing I always thought. Repurposing stuff for multiple outlets should be something that should be done often. And I feel like sometimes that's not. I felt like at my time in the news journal, that didn't happen a lot. 
Especially, it would be a fight just to try to get stuff that happened below Dover to get in the paper. I remember your story maybe about Brian Holloman getting the UMES job and they didn't even want to run it. I just like, hey, it's a Sussex Central grad that would probably mm-hmm. get eyes on it. Yeah, it didn't move the needle a lot, but still people did read it and people reacted to it. I always say that and I go back to my experience at the News Journal. There's a mentality that everything below not even below Dover, everything below the canal is not as much interesting. But the problem yeah. is this, you are Delaware online. You're not Northern Delaware online. You're not Newcastle County online. You're Delaware online. You're the paper of record in Delaware. And sometimes it doesn't seem that way. Yeah. I remember when you were there, you know, you and I were normally uh, contacting each other once a week, you know, regarding stories that we could uh, exchange between the two. Um, I will give Delaware Online credit for one story, though. It was during the governor's challenge. And um, oh, my goodness, this, I can't even think of the athlete's name. He goes by Bones, though, and, um, you know, played up near Wilmington, lost his family in a house fire and you know, was back on the court playing. We covered that because he's a governor's challenge athlete, which is held in Salisbury. You know, we got that angle. But uh, somebody at the News Journal saw we wrote about him, pulled it up put it on the front page, I believe, and that blew up for both sites. So, yeah, when it happens, it can be very beneficial for both. It needs to happen a lot more often. I mean, in the past, the Daily Times and the News Journal are really regarded as sister papers. Yeah, sometimes stepsisters like Cinderella. (laughs) Again, I can say this because I don't have to worry about going back, and I don't want to put you in any type of bind where you feel like you can't say what you want or get you into any type of trouble. But at this point, since I'm out of it, I have no problem tea spilling. I sound like a jaded uh, former employee, but then again, hey, if you work for Gannett Paper, you're most likely a jaded former employee nine out of ten times. I mean, at my new job, there's plenty of people who've worked at Gannett Papers in New Jersey, probably like at least 10 to 15 of them who at one time worked at a newspaper and I'm like, mm, yeah, this was not for me. <laughs> or you, know, you got to get out before you're kicked out. But yeah, I, I think that if done right, social media analytics can be used to get a good grasp on it. I always say that social media is like a uh, Pokemon and evolves so much to the point where you can never really get a full grasp on it. I like these analogies. And I I tell you, I also um, the newspaper advisor for the flyer over at SU. That's a whole nother story that, you know, I I didn't really want it, but no one else stepped up. So I was like, well, I'll kind of give back because that's the paper where I got my start. I wouldn't be working for the Daily Times had I never written for the flyer. But going over there, that's one thing I really try to preach to them is, look, I know we all love to see our names in print. I know we like to pick up the paper. But you need to write to an online audience. This is where we can see what's doing well, what people are into, and maybe what we need to cast to the side because it's not so popular. And just the year that we've really implemented that, we've seen great strides. And the numbers have, I think, increased maybe like 150%. So it's great. And that's another thing with the way that technology is evolving. Young journalists need to know what to do so they're not caught with their tail in between their legs when they come out of college. Yeah, and I think that's a huge thing, and I don't feel like there's an emphasis on that. Sometimes it's a bit of a trial by fire. Sometimes you're just, I hate trying to use all these analogies, but I just think of, just look at the Lion King and Mufasa and the Wildebeest. You just got to keep running or you're going to get run over. And yeah, that's pretty much... What you have to do, yeah, sometimes you'll get thrown to fire. I think one of my first assignments was a house fire in Tyaskin where the guy died. And it's like, I'm not sure what I need to do for this. And I've had times I've had to do stories where I do it on the most mundane things. Try to pull out 300 words for a story that's nearly impossible to get. I remember a story about, okay, a super centurion who died, 104 years old trying to reach out to the family members nobody wanted to talk how do you not talk about someone who's 104 years old who lived such a long life family squabbles aside there's still plenty of stories that can come out of that and it just makes you wonder i know some people will think well what's the point someone died and they're 100 years old those things don't happen that often and of course the other thought could be well if you do it on this person then you have to do it on this person and this person where you could end up building Mm -hmm. a trend i've done so many stories that honestly i didn't want to do but i'm like hey you know you're a team player do this because you don't want to be seen as a person who's the malcontent or the person who doesn't feel like doing the work and stuff like that and those are mainly news stories rarely has there been a sports story that i never wanted to do yeah 
Yeah. But you do bring up a good point because I think that is a common misconception when it comes to sports reporting is that sports reporters only cover sports. Nowadays, you need to be ready to cover anything. I'm pretty lucky. I don't often have to cover news stories, but there have been times where I can't remember if you worked with him, but Henry Colby House, who was uh, the crime reporter for us for about a year. Uh, that was after I was gone because I was still working with Vanessa. At okay. The that's right but anyway um he came up to me one day <laughs> yeah I, I did it to myself i for once i was done all my work i was kind of relaxing with my feet up at my desk and he throws down a brief and says write up this cop brief for me so i had to do that you know granted the white marlin open i guess is classified as sports but it's also news and i had to go up to baltimore when the whole case between phil heasley the winner who was accused of cheating you know, when he was on trial and I had to go up and sit in the courtroom and, you know, write down what was happening. I had gone to court before from my days with OCPD, but had I not had that background, I would have had no idea what was going on with all these legal terms and everything that happens in a courtroom. So you really have to be on your feet in this job. Right now, as we speak, we have two reporters on vacation and one of our, uh, our city reporters just left. So we're down to a very small staff at this particular moment. So should something come in, I need to be ready to uh, turn right news yeah i just don't understand oh man i just how many people are on the news staff that are active reporters we have what i call reporters row which is our row of cubicles we've got now that the city reporter just left we have three reporters in salisbury we've got two in bethany we've got one in virginia now we do have a photographer who is also classified as a journalist who is based out of salisbury but that's it. Yikes. Excuse me, we have three in Bethany. Not that that's much better. Yikes. Oh, my God. That's just... Wow. Eventually, they're going to keep trying to cut to the point where there's nothing else left to cut. I just don't understand. I mean, what else is there to do in a situation where you had to worry about potentially getting laid off? What? Sometimes you might be lucky and the dice don't roll in your favor. And then sometimes it's going to hit snake eyes and then... Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I just keep doing my work and I keep going day by day, I guess. If you weren't a journalist, what career field would you have pursued? I was wondering if you were going to ask me that. And I was thinking about it and I'm not really sure. Um, I like to um, teach, I guess. I'm not trying to sound like I'm this Yoda type, you know, with all this wisdom. You know, I'm only 24 years old, but I do really enjoy interacting with people. So I think maybe I would have gone into teaching or um, public service as well. Uh, my minor was political science, and I come from a pretty long background of people who have served their community and been involved in politics. So not saying I would have ever run for office. I'll, I'll never do that. But, you know, get involved and kind of give back to my community. I was going to ask you about that. Your dad was the former Wicomico County executive. Seeing what he went through going through the election cycle and things like that, what were some of the, I guess, most frustrating things about that, if any? Oh, there were certainly many. Uh, my sister always said, you know, living with your dad as a politician has several pros and cons. I do want to talk about the pros, though, because it by no means was it all bad. You know, I got to meet governors and senators and all these amazing people and it really is an amazing feeling when you walk into a place and somebody comes up and shakes your dad's hand and shakes your hand and thanks your dad for everything he's doing i mean it's just a feeling that it's hard to describe and i give my dad a lot of credit you know he, he's my hero and when he was first elected i was still very involved in sports and he would make time to always come see my sports games. He'd help me with homework. I mean, he, despite being a man in charge of Wicomico, if you will, he was always there. Um, the frustrating parts, it is hard when you're a high schooler, when you go almost everywhere in the county and someone knows who you are. I remember a week after my dad first got elected, we had a close family friend come over to the house. And given at the time, I was 12 years old. My sister was 10. And this person sat my sister and I down and said, look, you just need to be aware that because of your dad's position, you know, people are going to be judging your actions and judging him for them. So basically always be on guard. And we were kind of raised, live your life like you may run for office one day. Make sure you're always having fun, but just be aware of what you're doing. And I guess the message it can send. And again, when you're a high schooler and dad was kind of executive well into my junior year of college. 
So there are plenty of things, you know, I could have probably gotten caught doing that. It wouldn't be good for him, but I think it made me grow up faster, if that makes sense. Again, I was always Rick Pollitt's son. Now I'm known as Ricky Pollitt, the sports reporter. Don't get me wrong. I've never been frustrated living in his shadow, but it's nice to have my own identity now. Who were some of your maybe influences and, I guess, role models growing up sports-wise? Uh, in addition to your dad, I know you talked about him being your hero, but who were some of the other people that had a positive influence on you? Well, I love Gary Thorne. <laughs> Gary Thorne will forever be the man in my book, uh, you know, or- Orioles uh, broadcaster. My favorite Gary Thorne moment of all time, I think the Orioles were playing the Twins. It was the third inning, and all of a sudden you just hear Gary Thorne say, what do you mean they're out of hot dogs? It's the third inning. <laughs> and again, when, when I was big into broadcasting, that's the guy who I would listen to for hours and hours and you know take what he was doing and try to apply it to my own stuff. Another one was Al Michaels. Yeah, I love Al. The second his book came out, I went and got that. Again, you know, kind of when it just comes to sports reporting and sports journalism and broadcasting, obviously, I try to think of what Al would do. To be honest, and you know, I, I get a lot of criticism sometimes for this, but I grew up a big Ray Lewis fan. And um, mainly because I started paying attention to the Ravens and Ray Lewis as a middle schooler. So that was well after all the controversy with the murder had kind of uh, subsided. But just the way Ray was a leader and the way he spoke to people and always talked about a higher purpose and more to football that always you know really resonated with me but there were so many along the way so many athletes reporters who you know Stuart scott was a big one i mean he was the reason i wanted to work at espn one day and still wants to so i was really devastated the day he died but there's been so many people that have really um kind of inspired me to go into this line of work and growing up as well, ESPN was huge for me. Watching Dan Patrick and Keith Olbermann and Kenny Mayne and oh, I guess it was Steve Levy. I feel like Kenny Mayne would work with pretty much anybody. And of course, Stuart Scott and Rich Eisen. Those were the groups, the guys, even Craig Kilborn and like, I think Britt Haber or a few of those other guys saying them. And it's like, wow, I feel like ESPN has changed to the point over the past 25 years. Some people say for the better. Some people say a lot for the worse. I feel like back then in like 94, it was such a quirky network still, but it was before it hit its stride in the mid nineties and right before it jumped the shark in the early 2000s. I feel like there it was still mm-hmm. trying to find itself. You know, you still have Baseball Tonight on. You had Peter Gammons. You had everybody. And yeah, it just felt so different. And it's, I don't know. I hardly watch ESPN at all now. Other than the 30 for 30s, I don't really have much of a reason mm-hmm. to watch it. Yeah, when I was growing up, I'd come home every day and watch ESPN at Sports Center. I don't do it so much either anymore, but I credit that to I spend all day talking about sports and covering sports. It's nice to um, you know, take a little time off and whether it's hanging with friends or, you know, watching movies, kind of separating, you know, work from social life. Don't get me wrong, I I still watch as many Orioles and Ravens and Lakers games as I can, but uh it is nice to take a break from sports here and there. Seeing you're a Lakers fan, what were your thoughts when LeBron decided to head west and put on the purple and gold? I didn't believe it at first because, and we could spend a whole other hour talking about this, but I'll keep it short. With the Lakers recently, you hear about every offseason, oh, they're going to get XYZ. This is the year all the stars are coming to LA and we're going to return to the glory days. And it never happens until this offseason where we got LeBron and it was like Christmas morning. I remember... It was uh, 2012 where we got Dwight, Steve Nash came over, you know, we had Kobe, Powell, Metal World Peace, and I was sitting next to my friend. I was like, we're winning the next three NBA championships. And then obviously that completely went downhill. You know, Dwight, uh, don't get me started on Dwight Howard. But when LeBron came, I think it offered a sense of hope. And that hope, don't get me wrong, has been diminished a little here as of late. But as long as LeBron's on the Lakers, I think you'll always think we're going to have a chance. And I just think about that team you mentioned with Kobe, uh, Ron Artest, Paul Gasol, and Dwight Howard. I started getting visions of the the 0304 team with Shaq, Kobe, Carl Malone, Gary Payton, or even the one with Steve Nash and that one. And that felt like an utter disaster 
Even though they went to the finals, you saw it was falling apart. Malone was hurt. Peyton wasn't the glove. And Detroit just came in and manhandled them. And, yeah, it seems like sometimes the Lakers try to load up on free agents. Other times you have those times where shrewd moves and some good luck came in their place. The Showtime Lakers were basically a dumb trade, I think, by Cleveland that gave them the pick for James Worthy. Plus, already having Magic and then other guys just sort of along for the ride. Yeah. I feel like that's how nowadays a good team should be built that way through shrewd moves, good drafting, and some luck. Like the Celtics. The Celtics right now are a perfect example of that. And just like some of the early 80s Celtics, that early 80s Celtics dynasty was the same way that the Showtime Lakers were built. A dumb trade that ended up giving them Robert Parrish and the pick that ended up being Kevin McHale to go along with Larry Bird. And then another dumb trade that got Dennis Johnson and another dumb trade that gave him the pick for Len Bias. Apparently Red Auerbach built Seattle out of a lot of picks. But yeah, I just feel like that's the way a team should be built now. And I feel like in the NBA, it's just the chore watching. Yeah, there are still exciting teams. But honestly, I think maybe one of the best things for me as someone who now just casually watches the NBA is LeBron going west mm-hmm. because... One, I don't have to see him on the TV all the time. And by the time he is on TV, it's so late. I don't have to worry about it. And the Wizards have disappointed (laughs) me as usual. So I can always look at the score and I just think, same old sorry bullets. That's all they are. And I don't know. I feel like living in Sixers territory, I should be a little more engaged by watching them. But I don't know. I just feel like I've become a casual fan and I just have to start waiting until the playoffs to come up. We we went and saw LeBron and the Lakers play uh, the Wizards a few months months ago it's when John Wall went off and the Wizards won but it was nice to say you know I've seen one of the greatest basketball players of all time play live and it's funny people ask me all the time why are you a Lakers fan I mean you were what were you just jumping on the bandwagon in 2009 2010 and the reason is basketball was always my sport I'm a big guy and a lot of people assume I was this great football star but I always loved you know taking the court I was little smaller back in the day so you know i was a pretty good basketball player and when i was first getting into the sport shaq who was my favorite player was on the lakers so rather than follow shaquille o'neal all around the nba i decided to just stick with the lakers and i it's hard but i've been a loyal fan ever since well, let me ask you this question. Why is it something like the Skyhook is no longer a weapon that centers could utilize anymore as opposed to everybody and their mother starting to shoot three-pointers? Yeah, seriously. You know, I think it, it can even start at the high school level. Everyone wants to have the highlight reel. Everyone wants to see their name on Twitter with the most points, doing the most action. And I think that's one of the big problems with the game in general is no one wants to play their position and let me rephrase you need the guards the forwards the center and you need to know what your job is look some guys aren't going to go out and light up the scoreboard some guys aren't even going to score points some nights but your assignment could be get rebounds you know get the assist draw the guards off do something and i think it kind of goes back to the age of social media where again and as a media member you know you can blame me for it as well as others we're tweeting out the lead scores we're tweeting out the highlight reels and kids want to see their names they want to see what they're doing so they can get recognition and nowadays you know we see those kids go on to college and then eventually to the nba so i think it's just this new era of players which is really the cause of it all yeah, and the all-time leading scorer is still Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The guy was so talented, mm-hmm. they had a rule name for him in college basketball about dunking. And yeah. the fact yeah. that he was able to take what ended up being just a routine training drill like the Mike and Drill and turning it into one of the most diabolical offensive weapons ever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, nobody does a hook shot anymore. Nobody shoots granny-style free throws like Rick Barry. And nope. <laughs> if it works, it's a very effective thing. It just... You know, I don't know. You feel like in this ideal world where people want to stand out and be eccentric nowadays, you you can see it. I'm 36 now, so I can see that I've already lost touch with modern day things. (laughs) I mean, somebody shooting free throws underhand and making them. There's too many games in the NBA and college and high school. Too many missed free throws. And... It's easier to rag on NBA guys because they're getting paid to make free throws. You can shoot a shot fadeaway, turnaround jumper with three guys on you. You can't make an unguarded shot from 15 feet away. I don't know what it is. It frustrates me. Free throws win basketball games. You can ask the Parkside girls basketball team that lost the uh, Bayside championship last night. He shot like 40% from the line, if I remember. 
And I feel like there's an unfair double standard where when it comes to girls basketball, they should be more fundamentally sound than the boys because the perceived lack of athleticism and then everything under the realm instead of above the realm. And I feel like free throw shooting should be a mandatory thing because I remember Butch Waller, would, he'd have his team try to shoot the NCAA average of free throws. And that's about 60%. If you can make more than 60%, there's a good chance you're going to win the game. I remember many a time somebody... Brick free throws. Man, I go back to that game where Snow Hill lost by two in the state semis. Yeah, I think it was 2000. I can't remember when it was because it was Alan Miller's last game coaching. One player missed a bunch of three pointers and maybe was sick or just the angles and stuff. Two missed free throws. They lose by two. Yeah. That is the worst thing in the world because even if you have 20 attempts you only make 10 of them if you make half of the other half you miss that's a five point difference and i don't know it's just frustrating i feel like it's something that's missing in the game and and that should be something that definitely should be emphasized i can't remember who the coach was but i remember there was one that told me that for one practice he just lined his guys up the free throw line and said you need to make 50 shots until you walk out of this gym and that's all they did for however long it took. I wonder if in tougher, if they made them make 50 in a row, <laughs> then they'd be there. The <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> they'd still be there, probably. Oh. Ricky, I do appreciate you being a part of this podcast. I was really surprised to find out that you actually listened to it. I just, I didn't oh. know that it had the reach to people out there. You never know who's listening and i think that's a big thing yeah no i mean i you know your friend and a former daily time staffer i always try to support people from around here so anything i can ever do to help i mean i'm happy and i really appreciate you having me on what are some of the ways that people can reach out to you and connect with you i'm all over social media i will say though and (laughs) Yeah, I think I'm maybe one of a few reporters that don't do it. I don't, I guess, get involved with conversations as much on Twitter. And the reason I do that is because I feel like whether it's a text message, an email, or a tweet, it can sometimes be misconstrued. You know, you don't know if somebody's coming off sarcastic. You don't know the tone somebody's presenting. And as a reporter, I don't want to get into a fight with somebody on Twitter. You know, I know there are some guys who they'll wake up and they will have been put in a thread about whether the Bayside coin flip is a good idea. And they just keep going back and forth all day long. Number one, I'm like, don't you all have jobs? What are you doing? But, you know, I let my writing speak for itself. But to answer your question, I'm on Twitter at Ricky Pollitt 52. I'm on Facebook. I always encourage people to like our Facebook page, Shore Sports. It's really for anybody to post any kind of sports happening in the on the Eastern Shore, but it seems like I'm the only one who posts in there. But Shore Sports, that's where uh, you can find all my articles. And of course, on DelMarvinHour.com, I post stuff every day, do my best to cover as much as I can. And um, again, I love doing it. Well, Ricky, I do appreciate it. And I know you got a lot going on. So I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to participate in this interview. And I look forward to having you back again. Really appreciate it, Earl. Thanks.